G'day Legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day and so far a fantastic weekend. Now if you want to come and join the Telegram, I'm not too active now because I'm so busy but it is typically a lot more active and it's a good place for discussion and some stuff that I can't then show on YouTube. So today we're going to have a look at the maps, see what is moving. We'll look between both Syriac maps and deep state maps. We need to talk about Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his trip to Moscow and meeting with Russian President Putin. I want to talk about water and logistics and maybe clear some things up there from my experience as a soldier and then we will have a look over some footage as well. So look, I just want to start on this here because I saw this post and I just wanted to give my two cents because this is the internet and everyone has a two cents to give and I'm a YouTuber so I've got that in buckets. Anyway, this bloke, David, who's very big in like the pro-Ukrainian community uh, on Twitter, many experts are talking about airfields and production and this and that. Right now, I think that's a huge issue. Even the most devastating will be the lack of drinkable water in the Kherson area. With over 100,000 troops and little water will mean a hot summer for the Russian army at the front. They'll need 400,000 litres of water just not to die. So he's putting at four litres of water per soldier per day. Which you could easily consume four litres of water if you're moving and fighting and you know working on the front, digging this or that. But it would depend on the rotation and the level of intensity those troops are working at. If you're in a trench line somewhere, you need to remember a lot of the time is quiet, there's a lot of downtime, you may not be consuming that amount of water. But what people point at, and what he's getting at, is the logistics to get this here. 400 tonnes is 40 trucks, so 10,000 litres, 10 tonnes of water. The number's not that big. But talking about then these trucks then getting hit and logistical supply to the front. But I don't actually think many people know how that works. Like how do water get to the very front line? Well, there's a few different ways, but soldiers like when I was in the military, I would carry between eight, 10 to 12 liters of water, depending on what you're doing in your pack. So you've got, it was going by that four liters or maybe three liters per day. I'd more work off two to three liters per day, maybe three. And Australia is an incredibly hot environment, remember? Uh, you know, you are working three to four days. So you've got that amount then on you before you need a resupply. So of course that's working with the rotation of troops and when you rotate, new water then comes with those soldiers bringing their own. Also vehicles, armored vehicles will carry in uh, jerry cans from then rear positions. And what he's talking about specifically is, look on the map, down in Kherson and the supply either from uh, east to west into here or through Crimea into here that's going to become a problem. And I'm not saying that it's not going to be very difficult, but there are a lot of workarounds for this. You have water caches, so you've got bottled water or water sitting somewhere to use. You can have iodine tablets and cheap, incredibly useful. Water filters, all of this. So yes, I'm not saying that then, you know, this isn't going to be an issue and isn't already a problem. All logistics is a problem, but I just wanted to give my two cents on how exactly that works, how it then comes forward. It's not one truck driving to the front line with a hose filling up your bottles. It will be pepper potting forward. So it will go to one position, guys will pick it up, they'll work on that rotation. And all logistic is a problem. Not only in here, it's going to be a nightmare as well to get water, bullets and ammo to anywhere on the front line with drones, never underestimate how much of a problem that is. And of course, trench warfare, water, dirty drinking water, um, piss and shit in the trenches, all of this absolutely can breed then diseases. And of course that has a huge overall issue. But I just wanted to specifically speak on that water and how exactly that is, that guys are carrying in typically then their own water source. Now, let's have a look at some footage. So Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian pages have been posting this today that this was a command center in the Kherson region has been struck with several unnamed drones. So you can see then the burning building here. And the reason we believe this is a command center is some of the uh, vehicles shown have things like then this antenna and there was another like flatbed shown as well here. And you can tell that this is then the same 
building behind it in the Herson region. Now, we'll just have a look at some other footage. Battles and Beers actually then shared this, saying the Russian paratrooper of the 98th Guards Airborne Div uh, uses a makeshift platform out of the door. He walks across two balconies, blind fires his rifle into the next room, reportedly eastern neighbourhood of Shasiv Yar. Uh, no troops are visible, uh, could be genuine or, or propaganda to impress. And there's a lot of footage throughout this that could be one way or the other, but I just wanna have a look at this because I'm not that scared of heights, but there's no way I'm going out on this thing. So you can see Shasivyar completely destroyed, that there's a makeshift small, you can see it move as he treads on it there, comes out here, and then he's blind firing then around the corner here. So authentic or not, either way, standing out on that thing, but you can see the adaptiveness that you have to have in an urban warfare environment and urban warfare, the complexity then mixed with drones and everything, urban's already complex enough, a completely three-dimensional environment. Not only you have the lower level underground, then you've got upper levels, you know, 10, 15 storey buildings, and then everything in between mixed with drones and everything. And this is why I say, if you're wanting the attritional warfare to trick down your enemy, you don't want to be doing that in an urban center. You want to be doing that in your defensive lines and falling rearwards as they make their way through and falling into your arcs of fire. Now I can't show this video, I don't think, but you can see how different weapon systems are being rigged up. And of course we've seen, of course the RPGs on drones, mines on drones, basically everything on drones, even through to chemical weapons on drones. But you can see this Russian bloke here has a, a TM-62, I believe they're called, an anti-tank um, mine, and then throws it into then this building, and then a massive explosion then occurs. Apparently he just suffered a concussion, but I will say shockwaves absolutely can kill you. Now let's have then a look on the map. So here's Ukraine in the center, the capital of Kyiv. Red areas occupied since 22, the purple since 2014. So this has updated today and we do have a couple of updates. So I'm still getting used to this map, but we can just see there is a gray zone increase just in Volchansk here. You can see just that. So looks like either the well, it's the gray zone has increased. I'd just put this entire urban center. I think urban centers should either be red or green or gray because the actual control of building to building probably changes day by day, night by night, incredibly difficult environment like we spoke about, but there has been some increase in gray zone in here. And this is still showing very similar but I actually believe a bit less in some areas than the Suriac maps. Now, just in the center, yeah, look, it's apples and oranges then here, but what Suriac is showing in other maps, and I believe this, is that there isn't this disconnect that this map is showing here. Now, this has been now multiple weeks showing that there was a disconnect of Russian soldiers out here. Now, could it be gray in between here if no one controls it? Yeah, absolutely. Down this road, free these fire lines that are going to be down here, no one's going to control it, so to speak. But to say that there's no link between these the could, would be absolutely false at this amount of time that that has been there. Now, let's pick up and have a look down the map. So we don't see any changes up in the north. So this as this map has like increased, it's, um, it's way better with the satellite imagery, but it does take a little bit more to load. My internet is not great. So we don't see any shift in and around Buckmoot, I believe, no, but I do have, will that step rewards? No, but I do have a video for you here. So these are Russian uh, soldiers then putting up a flag in the Shasivyar Canal micro district here. So I don't actually have a geolocation on this, but this is being shared by everyone saying specifically that is where it is. And what we're talking about is this district here, of course, being fought or has been fought for incredibly hard. Ukraine did have a withdrawal. Russia had a push forward through here, back into here. Now, the next step here is going to be crossing then the reservoir here through some of this open territory. That is going to be very, very difficult for Russia to do. We may see more of a push on the flanks to try and envelop something rather than then straight down the front, urban warfare fighting again, dependent. This is the front of which I think we need to watch then the most closely. Uh, something I missed, that mine, the guy chucked in the building, that was said to be in New York. So a couple of updates here. We'll start this Toresk, New York, 
front. This is the area developing that Russia has reopened up, and we know there has been some problems in the Ukrainian command here. So we can see confirmed by this map that on this sort of middle of this um, western push that Ukraine, sorry, Russia has made some ground into Druzba here, heading toward Toretsk as well. So has broken in to these buildings and are moving forward in here from then this map. And you can see, of course, any re anywhere you push just straight up something like this, you do run the risk of being cut off somewhere in here, not only by troops, but at least by fire lines. Now, we had the same idea, and this is what people were saying originally in Osharetne, because out to Osharetne looked, you know, something like this, and everyone was saying, and you can go back and see all the thumbnails in their videos, that this is going to get cut off. What Russia did do successfully there, and they are now doing it here, is then fattening and expanding this area. And I think what they will be trying to do is trying to expand at least across to here to their 2014 line to protect this area but it's also then going to gain if this can occur it's going to gain then the ukrainian lines that have sat on this purple then for 10 years and that is very important same as if we see across into here by ukraine anywhere where it's been sitting for 10 years that area should have been built up for that amount of time is important and some maps are showing significantly further into New York. Some maps are showing out into these regions of where Russia was. I think we showed one of those yesterday, but the fattening there, move up, fatten, move up, fatten, a bit like my lifestyle. So let's just have a quick look then on the Syriac map in this same area, as I believe he shows very similar. So let's just have a look out here. So what he's showing, and this first push here to Druzba, see where this road turns down well, I guess to uh, the southwest. So he's showing that it's made it out past this road. So he's showing that the map is more so something like this here. And then let's come down to the New York front. Now, he isn't showing what I showed yesterday on one of the Russian maps that they've broken into, sorry, these buildings here he's not showing this he's showing that there is you know gray zone pushing up to here but he's showing that that expansion has started to occur as well and does show further expansion maybe to Yurivka, maybe not the amount on the east uh, may, very similar they, these are very similar here so it is very interesting to see now if you're wondering why i'm using this map Surik has updated the map but he hasn't actually done the write-ups for this Yep, yeah, that is interesting to look at. Next place we're going to be coming is just to the west of here and Avdivka Oshadatne front here. And what we can see is Russia have had a successful southerly push down then this tree line here. Now I did say yesterday, we did see a tree line hit with fabs and I wonder if this was it, the clearance of that and then be able to move down. Of course, exactly what this is doing is this is putting pressure on Novoselivska, Persia, areas like this here is going to put further pressure on this. And I think ultimately what we will see in here by the end of where Russia finishes its advancements will be that these open ground in here will come under control. Just the way to defend this is going to be very difficult. To fight through the open ground is going to be very difficult. But as you can see, and as we've seen, if you just go back on this map, two months and come forward, Russia's not doing that. They're moving down the urban centers and then they're enveloping and having Ukraine pull out of areas that have become undefendable. And of course, you look at this, you can see that this isn't going to be the greatest spot to be for fire lines and everything occurring in here. And this is then the exact area pushing down. I believe Syriac doesn't show the same amount. No, he's not it's saying down into here on the Ukrainian map itself. So we'll say that it's down into then this region. But as far as maps, that's then all I believe I have for you today. Let me just have a quick second look here. But no, that is all we've got. Robotny still hasn't changed. This area needs to be changing. Even I even see like the most pro-Ukrainian NAFO account saying that this is something like this, that this, yeah, this needs to shift on then the map. Now, let's talk about Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban visiting Putin, opening then a dialogue there. And of course, people are going completely mad about this happening. Now, I don't see any problem with this. This is what officials are meant to do. Now, it doesn't mean an official is going there to 
you know, sign deals or um, make peace or whatever, but, the, the, but officials are meant to have a dialogue. And I think that it is, officials are not doing their job if they've got, di if they don't have dialogue with both countries in which they're friendly or enemies towards. That's what officials are there for. It's not a soldier's job, but officials should have that. And it's probably more important to have it with countries of which you are then fighting with and maintain that. And if, the West is not at war with Russia, is constantly being said. Well, why then is there no dialogue or speaking about there at all? And I believe it's also what you know journalists should strive to do as well, not just be mouthpieces for specifically one side. Same with Tucker trying to interview then both sides. It's say what you will about Tucker, political whatever, but he's willing to then do that. So let's have a look at what then some officials from NATO and EU have said. Now, Viktor Orban has put this on his Twitter. Peace mission continues, second stop, Moscow is there currently. You cannot make peace from a comfortable armchair in Brussels. Even if the rotating EU presidency has no mandate to negotiate on behalf of the EU, so we cannot negotiate on behalf of the EU, we cannot sit back and wait for the war to miraculously end. We will serve as an important tool in making the first steps towards then. Peace. Now, Ursula von der Leyen put up this, but I reckon there's another one that was deleted. If you can look up deleted tweets, I'm not sure how to do it. I reckon there was one deleted that said something along the lines of, uh, I've got it written here, uh, the EU is not, uh, sorry, um, uh, Orban does not represent the EU, something along those lines. I swear I saw that and I couldn't find it, but uh, Viktor Orban is visiting Moscow. Appeasement will not stop Putin. Only unity and determination will pave the path to a comprehensive, just and lasting peace in Ukraine. Now, one thing I want to ask is, okay, people like Ursula von der Leyen, um, Stoltenberg, all these other officials, they keep saying, you know, this unity and de uh, determination will lead to a path for Ukraine, Ukraine's victory and the territorial integrity and this and that. One thing I want to ask is if this isn't successful in the end and where this ends, is anyone actually going to hold these people accountable? So say then, you know, it does end and the border gets redrawn somewhere. However, is anyone gonna hold these people accountable and say, well, you were pushing this war and you're pushing that we will win with this unity and determination and all of this, but then you've also backed out of that. If there is something signed down the line, will anyone actually be held accountable? Now I. It's a rhetorical question, I know the answer, but that was also something I think needs to be asked of officials uh, as well. So this is from actually the BBC. Um, Orban called a peace mission coming three days after a visit to Kiev where he met President Volodymyr Zelensky. So he's been to Kiev, spoken with Zelensky, and now he's going to Russia. Is this not what officials are meant to do? Anyway, Hungary has taken over the presidency of the Council of the EU, but EU leaders have stressed that Orban is not up acting on behalf of the bloc as we have then seen. He's maintained ties with Russia throughout then the war. After meeting, uh, after the meeting, which lasted several hours, Hungary's PM said Russia and Ukraine were still far apart in their views from achieving peace. Of course, we know where Russia is sitting. They want those territories and even areas of which they do not occupy currently, and Ukraine want all the 91 borders as per the peace, um, uh, the 10 point peace plan from Zelensky. Many steps are needed to end the war, but we took the first step to restore dialogue. That's from Viktor Orban. The Russian leader, Vladimir Putin, called it a frank and useful conversation. He also repeated a previously rejected proposal for Ukraine to withdraw from regions to the south and east of the country where Russia claims to have annexed. So exactly that um, deal he put forward just before then the uh, peace summit Peace, peace summit in Switzerland that he wanted a fallback from Kherson, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kharkiv, uh, sorry, not Kharkiv, Kherson, uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, and then he would then take those Ukraine pull back, neutrality, therefore, forward. Uh, but Ukraine, of course, rejected that, and so did the countries at then, the, or the majority of the friendly countries to Ukraine at then the peace summit. Regarding Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's visit to Moscow, this is from the Ukrainian um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, emphasised the decision to make the trip was made by the Hungarian side without approval or coordination with Ukraine. An EU NATO country does not need approval or coordination with Ukraine to open dialogue or do whatever, at least themselves, they can do whatever they then want. Coordination, hey, we're looking to do this, but 
the approvals yeah we remind that the principle of no agreements on ukraine without ukraine remains inviolable for our country and call on all states to strictly adhere to it so yes ukraine want no agreements to be made without ukraine then involved and agreeing to that agreement but we do know that the us NATO have so much power over Ukraine and where this war continues that if they start pulling back support, Ukraine will be for the hand would be forced or it would be a suicide mission. The peace formula, of course, Zelensky's 10 point peace plan, which number one is then nuclear security. And then you're talking five and six about territorial integrity and also then Part of this is going to be joining institutions like EU and NATO. We haven't seen any problems with Ukraine joining the EU, even from then the Istanbul stuff as well. But NATO, that Russia does not see this as part of it, what it wants as neutrality. As demonstrated at the first Global Peace Summit in Switzerland, which was also attended by Hungary, was not attended by Russia or China, but more than 100 states and international organisations share a vision of peace based on respect for the international, uh, sorry, territorial integrity of Ukraine and the UN Charter. The Peace Summit format is a key platform for finding ways to restore a just peace. Ukraine remains constructively inclined to further work with the development of bilateral cooperation and European integration following the hung Hungarian Prime Minister's visit to Kyiv. So again, I don't see any problem with what Orban has done. I believe that's what officials should be doing. Even if they're going there completely disagreeing with everything that the other side is saying, if you're not at an active war with them, if you're saying this, why can you not then do this? And you do not need approval or coordination if you've got your sovereignty of your state. But again, like we've spoken, the, the peace formula, the peace plan, the international, the global peace summit, the Global Peace Summit did fail to do its initial, what it, it knew that the European Western states were going to sign whatever was laid forward. Everyone knew this, but what it needed to do was rally up the Global South, which overall it really did fail to then do, especially with China and Russia not attending and countries from the Global South then who did attend, many didn't sign this either. And we know that if you know Russia wants those areas of which it doesn't occupy and neutrality, they're going to have to keep fighting. And if Ukraine want that 91 border, they're going to have to continue fighting. That at this point in time, that's not going to be found through some level of deal. But it will be interesting to see how this runs into the end of the year with, of course, that election coming up and the favourite for that at the moment, saying that there will be some end to it. Now, this is Stoltenberg talking from the NATO perspective rather than the EU on Hungary. Um, of course, Viktor Orban is not representing NATO uh, at these uh, meetings. Uh, he is representing uh, his own country. Um, uh, and... Um, and, uh, and, um, and Prime Minister Orban... Um, also, when I met him a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we also discussed uh, his upcoming visit to Kiev. So you may know that he also visited Kiev recently. Um, what is important is that uh, all allies, uh, also Hungary, uh, agrees that... Yeah, so, yes, he's not representing this, but that said, if you are a NATO EU country, no matter what you're doing, you are representing a part of that, especially with the powers and veto powers, which of course they're looking to remove that Hungary can have. But Hungary, and as Victor, as Victor Orban has said himself, operating a sovereign country to try and open something, to try and push that. We have seen Hungary being pushing right on that peace and guns falling silent and some way other out of this war than what is occurring on the front line, heading into, of course, in summer, into winter, then into another year, more years, of war and how that will look overall. Legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day uh, and a fantastic weekend and I'll speak to you tomorrow. Thank you, bye-bye.